do you find if you are working at, and I don't know, maybe I should back up. I don't know if you work primarily with one-on-one individual coaching or if you're coming in and doing corporate training, but maybe this may sound devil's advocate and I don't mean it to be, but do you find with structured thinkers because the thing, and I come from finance, so I can consider myself in that boat too. Is there a rigidity where they don't see DEI initiatives as a creative solution or is that, I don't want to say a harder sell because I don't mean to frame it up like it's not important. It needs to be just the way we do work. But do you see in the structured spaces that's more difficult to embody that in those departments? Yes. And I think from a corporate level, what you just said, this is the way we do work where they think, oh, this is already working. We have the E&I, we have people of color already in Mm -hmm. our corporations and they're looking at it from a percentage standpoint. Yes, you have it. (laughs) But is it working? And part of D, we say like DE&I and it goes beyond just like what you see when you look at someone. It's their background. Their the personal culture, the way that they think, what they mm-hmm. have like been uh, studying, their career, because all of that contributes to innovation and like creativity yes. and great problem solving in the office space. So a hundred percent, thank you for being devil's advocate because yeah, a lot of times like oh yeah, we're already doing this, but are you really? Uh, I, I, yes, and it, it's very easy to look at percentages or data, but. It really gets put to the test when you're in a room and I think differently or I solve a problem differently. And is that accepted or that's the part of inclusion, right? Mm -hmm. It's different methods of thinking, the way we see problems. And so I don't know how you measure that. I don't know how you measure that. Yeah. One of the things that we do with companies is like when we go in, whether we work on three areas where we do performance, balance, and DNI. And when we go in, we try to determine like, what is your goal so that we can set some like KPIs and benchmarks. So at the end of the program, we can try to measure as well as continuously long going, because sometimes it takes longer than like three months, six months to get mm-hmm. to it. But Yes, like how do you measure innovation? How do you measure people having a seat at the table? And one specific example, I was doing one-on-one coaching with a person that reported into the C-suite and had a seat at the table. She was definitely one of these alternative thinkers. And because she was being pushed back, she finally just decided to take a step down. And I was like, I love the company, but... This is too much on my mental health to have me constantly being pushed back by those who are more, um, they think the same way. So there are ways to measure a lot of time. It's in, if we're talking about performance, how many people are being promoted, or even if we can look at aggregate levels of performance reviews, the numbers and ratings, and like those type of number-based measurements to determine what, if we're meet, meeting the goal and what needs to change. You mentioned the numbers, and I'm thinking about the lawsuit right now that the National Football League here in the U.S. is going through, where mm-hmm. they had this program where they're supposed to start hiring and making sure that every club, when they had a hired coaches, they interviewed people of color. And so they, were, there's, they are, and they were still making the numbers. We were interviewing this many people. But it turns out after the last 10 years of doing this, they realized that if they do hire a coach of color, they let them go quicker. It doesn't get as much time as the other coach. And most of the time they're just interviewing so they make the numbers. That is culture. That's got to be pretty hard to do. But also, if we play the other side of the fence, there's a thing about being safe. And sometimes we don't want to change our culture because we're not, we don't feel it's safe. I'm, I'm just wondering, when you're doing a workshop, I know you do a workshop and personal trainings and things like that, but I'm just wondering, what's your game plan to help coaches feel safe in making this change? Yeah, I think part of the thing you have to address is, why don't they feel safe? Do you not feel safe because you're up against change? Do you not feel safe because you think you may lose your job, your position, your rank, your power? 
So those are the type of conversations that's often had in one-on-one -on -one coaching. So depending on like the program, we offer workshops, which is more of a collective and there's certain things people won't say, but I think one of the many, I almost want to say like blessings or one of the great things <laughs> I love about coaching is that in one-on-one, -on -one, we get to hear the inner thoughts of people. That's where you can really start sh not shaping but helping people get a different perspective on why don't you feel safe so in a group people don't feel comfortable being that vulnerable and saying that but in the workshops we try to give examples we try to put different perspectives out there so that when they go into the one-on-one -on -one, it piques their interest and they bring it up with their coach and can talk about that in a safe space versus in a group and collective where they say, bring your whole self to work, but there are thoughts that you may not actually want to share because it's going against tradition. It's going against the change that we're seeing in our countries. And that's the lack of safety there. You don't want to bring up the thought because like the example you use, she eventually had to step down because it's getting to be enough by it. Yeah. 